when male chicks are born, they're not needed. So they'll generally be thrown alive into a machine called a macerator, which just grinds them up alive. <laughs> so that's a pretty grim Yikes. Uh, fact. Their wild ancestors would have produced about an egg a month. Um, they produce now on commercial farms about 300 eggs a year. Those chickens that have grown so fast, uh, like put on so much weight so quickly that they kind of can't stand up properly. They're all like a little bit like deformed. There's like a lot of breast meat and, you know, they're just, they're, their legs can't really carry the weight very well. You know, impregnated multiple times, have a calf, have the calf taken away and have her milk taken away to be sold to humans. So again, this is quite depressing, but it's basically it's a mother who keeps getting impregnated and then her babies keep getting taken away from her. Yes. And then this process repeats until she can't produce milk anymore. Yeah, pretty much. So, yes. In this episode, we'll discuss the meat industry, what it's like and how it works. For the average consumer, probably their only interaction with the meat industry is buying meat at the grocery store. But what happens before that? What's it like for farmed animals from birth to slaughter, and how exactly does this all work? Today, I interview Claire Hamlet, freelance writer on animal justice, animal agriculture, and the environment, to uncover this mystery. It's going to be packed with information, so let's jump right in. Welcome to the EcoChat Podcast. In each episode, we chat with experts in conservation, animal welfare, sustainability, or environmental science to learn how you and I can make a difference for the planet. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hey, Claire, how's it going? Hi, it's good, Sam. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. We have a lot to cover today. So, yeah, where do you want to start? Yeah, let's uh, let's start with chickens. So we can talk about layer hens and um, broiler chickens, or you might call them poultry chickens in North America. Um, so, so layer hens, so they're obviously, um, bred to, to lay eggs. Um, so they're, uh, really bred to produce quite a lot more eggs than they would in the wild. So, uh, their wild ancestors would have produced about an egg a month. Um, they produce now on commercial farms about 300 eggs a year. Um, so quite an increase. Uh, yeah, so um, they are uh, like broiler chickens. They all um, start their lives in hatcheries, um, like sort of these industrial hatcheries, um, and they'll be bred there. And then um, with the um, egg industry, uh, the thing is, they only really want female chickens because they'll also lay eggs. So uh, one of the big problems with this industry is that when male chicks are born. Um, they're not needed. So they'll generally be thrown alive into a machine called a macerator, which just grinds them up alive. <laughs> so that's a pretty grim Yikes. Uh, fact about what happens to male chickens in the industry. Um, so, so there's there's uh, some places that are trying to overcome this problem. I think in Germany, they've now um, developed a way of uh, sort of sexing the eggs before they hatch. So they can just get rid of the ones that would be born male, which obviously is a lot more humane um and doing this to poor baby chicks um but uh anyway for the rest of them they end up then going off you know get getting sent at about a day old um to various farms where they become layer hens um where they will then produce many eggs a year um until the end of their productive life at which point they'll be slaughtered the eggs that these layer hens produce would a subset of female eggs be selected to become the next generation of layer hens no not in the not in the farms because for the farms obviously they're just producing the eggs which will get sold as eggs so it's really it's just in the hatcheries where the male chicks will get sorted by sex and um because they don't need the male chicks they'll get um they'll get killed there so the, there's a breeding flock uh, which is like separate and then there's the flock that produces the eggs which gets sold on to consumers got it you mentioned a crazy fact which is that these chickens are selectively bred by humans to produce like 300 eggs per year. Yeah. That's insane. That's almost like one per day. Wouldn't they feel constantly uncomfortable? Uh, yeah, it's not great. Um, it sort of, because eggs are, um, the shells are calcium carbonate. So they, um, they take calcium from the chicken's bodies to, you know, to be created. Uh, so it can be quite like physically depleting for them. So, um, they'll tend to have, food topped up 
um, with calcium so that they can, you know, uh, produce enough, but it's still, it's still not really great for them. Um, and any animal that's selectively bred to, to be, you know, much more productive in some way than they would be naturally, um, it does take a toll on their bodies. Yeah, it must be very draining. So these female chicks that eventually make it to these egg laying facilities, what happens to them afterwards and what are the conditions like? Yeah, so um, layer hens actually have it really the worst in lots of ways um, because they uh, can still be kept in cages uh, pretty much everywhere. So in the European Union, they banned the use of um, battery, like barren battery cages uh, like those tiny little ones where they kind of can't move and there's like nothing to, um, you know, uh, give the chickens any kind of activity to do um, other than be crammed in there and lay eggs. Um, so they banned those in the EU in 2012, um, but they're still allowed to use enriched cages. So these are very slightly larger. They're supposed to have things like perches um, and different levels so the chickens can like, you know, do natural things like perch and that kind of thing. Um, but they're not, great still they're still quite small and these chickens are still spending their lives in a cage which really for any animal is horrible um so in places like the us and lots of other parts of the world battery cages still totally legal um so that's where a lot of eggs will come from um i think i don't know how it is in like the us and canada here they do mark the um the egg cartons with whether they came from um like a cage system or a a barn system or a free range system. Um, so at least cages do make up a fairly small proportion of the eggs that are sold here because of consumer demand that they be free range. Um, but free range barns can be, it's a bit misleading, um, what they can be like as well. Uh, they're not, they're not always that amazing. Um, they have to have a certain amount of time outside here a day. Um, but they, uh, can often be crammed quite a lot of them into um, sheds together the rest of the time. Uh, elsewhere, there there's not really that much regulation around the term free range. So like in the US, it can mean all sorts of things, like sort of what whatever people want it to mean. Um, so the only way to know for sure if they're getting some uh, proper outdoor access would be to look for certain like welfare certifications like um, uh, GAP, um, that sort of thing will have uh, their own standards, which they set. Uh, so if a consumer is really worried about the eggs being free range, they can go and look for for those standards and they'll be able to see. Um, but they can't depend on the US government to have legislated in favor of chickens having a certain amount of time outside. Okay, to recap on the living conditions, you mentioned in North America, battery cages still exist. In mm -hmm. the EU, those are now banned, but they still have quote-unquote enriched cages. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the size of these battery cages in North America? Like per chicken, how much space do they actually get? Yeah, so the, sta the standard sort of way of describing it is like a um, sort of an A4 sheet of paper per chicken. Yikes. So it's a really small, so I'm looking at my notebook right now, thinking about what the size of a chicken is. Um, yeah, very small. So so really, really crammed in. Um, they'll often be, you know, and they're not usually by themselves in a cage. Um there's often several in a cage, so uh, very cramped conditions for them. They don't really have room to stretch their wings or to do anything normally that a chicken would want to do, like pecking and scratching at the ground and that kind of thing. Uh, they're often sitting on a sort of wire um, uh, bottom of the cage so that all their feces and waste can fall through. And then there's um, uh, a little like conveyor belt that the eggs roll onto. And so they'll just get sort of carried away. So it's all very, you know, obviously very like mechanical and um, and everything's kind of made to be as mechanical as possible and uh, with as little like, you know, need for humans to come in and sort of do things manually all the time um, for the chickens because that's how you have uh, successful industrial egg production. I just pulled up an A4 piece of paper and that seems really small for a chicken. Like a yeah. chicken <laughs> is not small. So if you put a chicken on a A4 piece of paper, it doesn't even have room to turn around, right? No, yeah, it's very, very, very tight quarters for them. Right. And you mentioned these chickens are basically standing on this wire mesh, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're standing in this cage their whole lives. So I was curious, for a chicken in the wild, what conditions would be optimal for them? Like, what types of conditions would a chicken be happiest naturally? 
I'm not an expert on like how chickens love to live in the wild, <laughs> but they do, they have some behaviors that, uh, you know, are considered kind of natural. Um, they do things like dust bathing. Um, they like to, um, peck and scratch and they, you know, they, they scavenge for like insects and stuff like that to eat. Um, so they really do like to sort of wander around. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen chickens just kind of roaming happily around, but they, you know, they like to strut about and, sort of um you know they're quite curious um i've definitely stayed in a campsite pretty recently with lots of um chickens that were rescued from um the the meat industry actually or the no from the sorry the um egg industry and they just will come walk all over the campsite come up to you be interested in your food they're they're very curious they're very social um they do they don't mind interacting with people they'll form their own sort of um social groups um yeah so there's there's a lot of behaviors that they would engage in um naturally and that they enjoy which they just don't get to do uh when they're kept in a cage or even when they're kept like in a very overcrowded barn um just because there's not there's not really those right conditions there's not the space for it um and obviously in in very cramped environments it's very stressful for animals um which you know can lead to things like feather pecking um, can be quite a problem where they'll sort of peck at, uh, other chickens. So de-beaking is quite a normal, um, practice in some places. Uh, so they'll, they'll remove, uh, part of the beak at least to, to sort of reduce, uh, the amount of pecking that goes on and the, because it can be, um, harmful to other chickens, obviously. So, um, that's one of the things that comes up a lot is, um, you know, animals, behaving in sort of aggressive ways towards each other when they're put into these quite cramped and natural conditions where they don't really get to do anything that's kind of nice for them or pleasurable for them or natural for them. Can you tell us more about the debeaking? So how does it work? And I mean, does it hurt the chicken? Yeah, there's there's a few ways. Um, one of them can, so they snip, they'll snip the beak off that um, I think there's like a sort of like um, little device that kind of clips it off almost like a nail clip type thing. But uh once it's off um sometimes there'll be um essentially the wound is like cauterized um but it can still lead to things like because this happens when they're quite young it can lead to things like abnormal growths um and pain at the site um of the of the debeaking so um it's really not not great for them and i mean if you imagine with you know like if if you had like a bit of your finger cut off and you know you then it was like quite crudely um sort of uh, had the bleeding staunched it wouldn't it wouldn't heal wonderfully um so it's the, same, it's the same kind of thing really like any any of these sort of like routine mutilations or, or mutilations that are supposed to be used only in the uk they're only supposed to be used in situations where they can't be avoided um but i mean they you know they do still happen quite often um because as i said in 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 those conditions um you know certain behaviors become quite common which means that the farmer then needs to deal with that to um, stop it from interfering with making a profit out of these animals. So, um, yeah, so it's not it's not really great. Um, also, when you're dealing with, like, say you're on a farm, you're dealing with loads and loads of animals because um, there's often, like, you know, thousands upon thousands of, of birds kept in uh, one farm um, or even in just, like, you know, in one shed and there'll be maybe multiple sheds on a farm. Um, you think about how few people there will be to tend to each animal. Um, so these things often are, you know, quite like you want to get it done and sort of <laughs> move on to the next animal. So it's not like there's loads and loads of care necessarily always being taken uh, to, to make sure that everything's done, you know, perfectly and, um, and, and in a way that would cause like absolutely minimum um, suffering to the animal. Right. So we mentioned that egg-laying hens, they are kept in battery cages, which are still legal in North America. It's only the size of an A4 sheet of paper. In the EU, it's slightly better. They are kept in, quote-unquote, enriched battery cages. How much better are enriched battery cages? It's not huge. And enriched cages, I mentioned, they're supposed to have like some perches and things um, so that the, the chicken can engage in some normal behaviors, and they're supposed to have slightly fewer chickens in them so that um, they're not as crammed in together. So they're a little bit better, but still a cage. Got it. And you mentioned free range a second ago. What exactly is the definition of free range? Here, it requires animals to have a certain amount of time outside. And so they won't, they won't be kept in cages. So like chickens would be brought in at night 
um, but they'd be let out through like they call them uh, they're like little uh, they're called pop holes or something like that, and they they can sort of like go outside of their own accord um, in the daytime. So yeah, they do they do get some access to some outside areas or they'll have these kind of mobile barns that they can like move around um so they can move chickens around to new new spots on a pasture or something makes sense so if we see the label free range on a carton of eggs how trustworthy is that like is this enforced how do we know for sure that those chickens do have access to the outdoors it depends on where you are i mean here here it means a bit more um, to say it's free range than it does in, in and here, I mean, the UK, than it does in the US. Um, as I said, if you wanted to check in the US, you'd really have to look for a welfare label um, where that certification scheme has its own standards that have to be met for what free range means. So that will tell you, you know, the chickens have to have this much space and are allowed outside for this long a day or whatever. Um, so they'll, they'll set their own standards, but that, that's like the safest way, um, to, or, or the, the most trustworthy way, I suppose, um, to check on, on the actual living conditions of chickens. If, if there's not good legislation in place for them, um, then it's really like the, essentially the certification schemes, which set their own standards, um, that you'd have to look at. You kind of touched on this, but how are eggs collected and how are things maintained inside these facilities? If you think about how, like, if there's thousands of chickens in the shed laying, you know, an egg a day, um, it's quite, it's quite a lot of eggs. So, so that's really how it gets done. So these, like I said, these hatcheries where they come from as well, they're also sort of an industrial operation. Um, so it's everything's really made to be run as kind of cheaply as possible and, and, and in as small a space as possible. And it's, it's, in a horrible way an extremely efficient system so it yeah so that's that's why there are so many eggs available (laughs) you know if you were just getting them from like your neighborhood backyard flock of chickens there wouldn't there wouldn't be nearly as many um to go around so uh yeah it's a really massive operation right and all the eggs that these chickens lay they just roll down into some conveyor belt yeah and then they get and then they get carried away to i guess get sorted got it got it and then what happens to a hen after she stops producing? Um, typically, they'll be sent off to slaughter. Um, a few lucky ones might get rescued and, um, you know, get to live out their days on a, in, a, in a sanctuary or in someone's garden or something. Um, there's a There are quite a few, like, sort of laying hen um, rescue uh, initiatives about um, to try and facilitate that. But... Um, yeah, mostly they'll they'll just end up going for slaughter. Um, you know, chickens will get turned into all sorts of food for all sorts of things. Um, you know, animals and uh, for for sorry for pets and for as well as for humans. So seems like a pretty sad and dismal life. I mean, they're just bred to keep producing unnatural amounts of eggs throughout their lives, and once they stop producing, they get slaughtered. Yeah, and that's not to say. The other animals that we'll talk about have it any better. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's a pretty depressing life for layer hens. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have poultry chickens. So what's it like for them? So, similar sort of, um, you know, coming from an industrial hatchery, um, but uh, they don't they don't need to get rid of the male ones um, uh, necessarily. Um, but the, the poultry chickens are bred to grow really fast. Uh, at, at least most farms, like commercial farms, will use these faster growing breeds. So you've probably heard of um, Franken chickens by now. Uh, this is, you know, a, the word for those chickens that have grown um, so fast, uh, like put on so much weight so quickly that they kind of can't stand up properly. They're all like a little bit like deformed. Um, there's like a lot of breast meat, and you know, they're just their their legs can't really carry the rate the weight very well. Um, so they're pretty unhealthy chickens in lots of ways as well you know they have a lot of joint problems they'll get sores on their bodies because they can't really get up and walk around properly um so so that's one of the major welfare problems with um sort of commercial broiler chickens is how fast they grow um so that here they won't typically be kept in cages um in in the states and things i'm i'm not entirely sure but i think mostly they're in barns um but there can be you know, tens of thousands of them 
uh, in a barn at any one time. So it's again, it's like, okay, it's not a cage, but it's like very cramped conditions. It's very stressful conditions. Um, you know, there's not always enough water to go around. Um, there's been investigations into farms that have shown uh, there's too little, like there's only a few of these like little water troughs um, per however many chickens. And, it, they, you know, some of them can really struggle to to get enough to drink. Um, so, yeah, also also awful conditions, even if it's not cages. Um, and then in addition to that, you have these all these sort of health problems that come with with how fast they grow. Um, because they slaughter them at about six weeks old when they hit, um, between sort of two kilos, three and a half kilos, um, is their sort of slaughter weight. So, um, it's, uh, it's, it's described often as like a, you know, if a, a human, um, became the size of a, you know, a three year old only in the first like six months of life or something like that, it'd be, you know, that kind of growth. It's a bit, um, a bit frightening. In terms of the barn conditions, what's it like? Like, is it just barren ground or is there any enrichment like perches? Um, sometimes uh, there will be perches. There's supposed to be some enrichment in some places, but again, it's just, you know, with the amount of chickens in there, like how crowded, how crowded it is. Like if you just, you know, you could Google images of like, um, intensive poultry farm and you can just see the pictures of just how many chickens are crammed in together. Um, so they're not they're not really living good lives um even if there's like a little bit of enrichment for them um you know some of the investigations into these places have shown you know chickens will um get sick and die and they'll just kind of get trampled on by other chickens like it's just it's it's quite the whole thing's quite unsanitary the the sheds get cleaned out sort of once at the end of um once once a flock is sent off to slaughter, then the whole shed will get cleaned out because obviously otherwise they can't take out tens of thousands of chickens that easily to like clean it daily or anything. So for about six weeks, they're all sitting in there um, sort of just on top of their own waste as well. So that's why they'll, they'll get the sores on their bodies and on their feet sometimes because there's a lot of ammonia from, um, from their urine and their feces. Um, so not great conditions for the chickens um, overall. For layer hens, you mentioned that their feces, their waste goes straight down through the cage, right? Yeah. But for these poultry hens, it's just on the floor and they basically step on their waste for six weeks? Yeah. Okay. And also comparing to layer hens, you mentioned the minimum space that they're given is an A4 sheet of paper per chicken. What about for these poultry chickens? How much space are they given? So in the UK, um, you can have... Uh, birds are up to 33 kilos per square meter. So that's, that's like the total weight of, um, the birds that you can fit into a square meter. Um, so if they're, they're reaching what about th- sort of three kilos, um, for their slaughter weight, um, by the time they're sort of at that, at that size, then that's what 11 birds, 11 birds per square meter. Not, not loads of space. Yeah, it still sounds very cramped to me. And then what's the slaughter process like? Um, well, first they they need to transport them. So this um, is often quite a stressful process. Um, they usually just sort of grabbed, the chickens are just kind of grabbed and put into um, crates in a truck. Um, and then, so, you know, being grabbed by people <laughs> coming in and just sort of grabbing you whatever way they can is um, quite stressful. There's like rules here at least about how um chickens are supposed to be handled again investigations have shown it's not always um done that gently um so chickens will often end up at the slaughterhouse already with injuries like broken legs broken wings that kind of thing uh, from being really roughly handled um in the transport process um also quite a lot of chickens die before they get to slaughter like on the way um and on farm before they even leave the farm um, something like a, mi- a million a week was found to be um, dying in the UK um, before they even reached the slaughterhouse. So um, quite quite a bad um, sort of welfare situation for them. Um, and then once they get to the, the slaughterhouse, um, there's, I mean, there's a few ways that they might be killed. Uh, one of the more common ones now is gassing them. So in theory, this is supposed to be a bit less stressful for them because they just stay in the crates and they'll sort of move through a chamber that um, they'll increase the, the carbon dioxide in it um, until they are 
until they're dead, until they're unconscious, and then they will um, uh, uh, shackle them and, and slit their throats. So um, that's one way of doing it. Um, another, which I mean, is not lovely <laughs> if you think about it. Getting sort of suffocated by carbon dioxide is, um, you know, has been shown to be like quite an abrasive uh, sort of thing. So not great. So gradually increasing the carbon dioxide until they die. Is that stressful or painful for them or do they not feel anything? Um, I think that breathing in the carbon dioxide can be, is a quite like abrasive, like if you were breathing it in at those sorts of concentrations. So um, not really great. Um, And there has been videos at least of, I think it was actually of pigs though, sort of like really thrashing about and obviously looking quite distressed as they were being, um, you know, stunned by carbon dioxide gassing. So I don't think it's, uh, particularly humane um but another way that they'll do it is um electrical stunning so they'll like sort of dip them into a um a a bucket of water where some uh, an electrical current goes through and that's supposed to stun them unconscious before they're shackled by their feet and then have their throats cut um that doesn't always necessarily work um and again there's been uh footage like undercover footage taken showing like birds being improperly stunned before they're, they're shackled. Um, and so they're sort of still conscious when, when they're hanging upside down, which is a horrible experience for them. So yeah, the whole source process can be quite, um, quite stressful. And again, it's just like when there's, you know, um, these places dealing with a lot of birds. Um, do you remember a few years ago, there was a, a thing in the U S about increasing the, the line speeds in slaughterhouses so like killing more animals like per you know hour or whatever um it's already quite fast um some places will process like thousands of animals a day so uh you can imagine those conditions are not exactly again it's like not like people there it working in lovely conditions caring so gently for the animals it's like quite stressful quite noisy um, quite unpleasant conditions that that create stress in the workers as well as the animals. So really not um, conducive to sort of a, a gentle, humane death at all. Hmm, got it, got it. All right, we can move on to pigs now. So for pigs, it's only one use case. It's for their meat, right? So what's it like for pigs and how are they born and raised? So pig farms tend to be quite intensive um, in a lot of places. So um, They'll again be like quite a lot of pigs in um, quite small pens together. They can be quite dirty. Um, there's a lot of footage of like pigs just kind of covered in filth, covered in their own feces um, inside farms, which actually pigs do like to stay quite clean. So, you know, despite their sort of reputation. Um, so the way that they are kept is um, often like pretty sort of against their nature, against what they would prefer, against like how they they would, you know, choose to live where they're given the choice. Um, they will have their babies on the farm, which will be raised up to become, you know, uh, meat pigs. So they'll have breeding breeding sows on the farms um, and they will be kept in, um, well, in, in, in most places, they'll be kept in um, what we call farrowing, farrowing crates. Um, so, There's varying lengths of time that they can be kept in these cages. Um, Here, I think it's up to five weeks. Um, It can be longer in other places. So um, they'll, the cells, once they're about a week out from giving birth, will be put in these crates and then be kept in there um, while their um, piglets are weaning. um, So for the next like four weeks or so. Um, So they don't really have any room to, to move or turn around or really do anything at all. The idea of these, cages is that it protects um the piglets from getting crushed by the mother uh which does happen you know in uh if a pig is sort of like nesting in a, you know a sort of natural way then they do sometimes crush their piglets so you know roll over onto them um but it's again it it's a problem of uh you know trying to raise lots of pigs so that you have a commercially viable pig farm um it's not conducive to having pigs be able to kind of like you know raise their piglets in a sort of natural way necessarily um and in my view if the only way to safely 
uh, raise piglets on a farm is to keep the mothers in cages for five weeks. I don't think that that should happen. Um, so in California, you've probably heard of Proposition 12. Um, so Californians uh, voted to ban cages for um, for farmed animals. And um, this has been like a huge thing. There was like a big appeal at this, uh, the Supreme Court um, by the pork industry and by a lot of um, meat industry actors who objected to this and tried to overturn it and uh, on the grounds that um, it would stop uh it would be unfair on um trade from other states so that they you know if if a uh, if another state was raising pigs using gestation crates or farrowing crates um they wouldn't then be able to sell their pork in California so um that was the objection but the supreme court in the end um upheld the original vote uh, which is like a huge win for animal welfare yeah i've seen photos of these gestation crates and they seem very restrictive yeah like the mom barely has any room to move yeah they're, well they're sort of she's sort of lying uh, you know lying down but like that sort of it i don't think yeah I mean, she can't even turn right no no turning around no and she needs to stay in there for how long um well in the uk up to five weeks um it, it can be longer so a gestation crate so we call them farrowing crates to sort of indicate, oh, it's only really used um, just around the time of birth and for the few weeks after birth. Whereas gestation crates tend to be like more like the whole period that the pig's pregnant for. Um, so quite a lot longer. So um, yeah, it's and gestation crates are um, not not legal everywhere, but in certain places they're, they're definitely still used. And it might be, uh, you know, a, a thing where you can, look at the if there's a welfare certification for the pork you're buying um, and that might tell you more about like what they do around farrowing crates and gestation crates okay so after five weeks the piglets move on to the next stage what happens to the mom afterwards yeah so they'll have they do have like multiple um litters of piglets uh in their in their lives so um really like like sort of any breeding animal in a in a farming system it's just sort of you know, um, they're there to be productive. And then when they're no longer productive, um, they just sort of tend to get slaughtered. Uh, so they'll be, yeah, they'll be, oh, I found it now. Um, so they'll, they'll have about three to five litters. Um, and then eventually will be, will be cold. So they might be about two years old by that point. Okay. So the mom is essentially a breeding machine, right? So after the piglets move on to the next stage, she gets impregnated again, and this whole process is just rinse and repeat? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then for the piglets, what happens to them after five weeks? Um, yeah, so they uh, will be, you know, uh, put into, into pens um, and sort of fattened up, essentially. Um, so they're fed on, uh, when, they're, when they're kept indoors, they're fed on um, a sort of mixture of grain, um, things to sort of fatten them up quite quickly. Um, I forgot to mention this with the chickens as well. It's kind of the same thing. So they get, um, pigs and, uh, chickens consume a lot of soy. Um, so which is where most soy in the world goes to is, is feeding farmed animals. Um, so they will, and uh, it's like very high protein. So, uh, they get fat quite quick on that and they get large quite quick on that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and it's just mostly intensive, um, for pigs. The farming systems that they're kept in, um, sometimes they're enriched. So they'll have more like, you know, straw and things that they can kind of root around in. Um, you know, how pigs like to root around in the ground with their noses. So an enriched indoor pig farming system will have that kind of thing to, um, give them something a bit more to do. Um, and then in a few cases, they'll be kept outdoors, which is a lot more natural for them. Um, or they'll have like access to outdoor areas. Um, so like organic pig farming would um, typically be be an outdoor system. But for the most part, it's intensive. Okay. Are they cramped in any way? Like how much space is given per pig? And then what are the sanitary or welfare conditions like? They are kept um, in fairly high stocking densities. Um, and sort of like I mentioned earlier, they're often don't get cleaned enough. Certainly you see... Um, video footage of of pigs that are really quite filthy um you know it covered in a lot of varying feces um and it's just not um again it's not a great 
situation for them being indoors, especially when it's a sort of barren place, um, maybe with just like a, you know, a concrete floor or something and not anything for them to do. Pigs are incredibly smart as, you know, uh, as everybody knows at this point, those sort of experiments and things have shown just how clever they are. So you can imagine what sort of frustrating uh, situation this is for them to be in where they've, you know, they're sort of all crammed in together, don't have a lot to do. Um, like with chickens, that can lead to certain problems like tail biting. Um, so piglets will often have their tails docked um, when they're pretty young still. So that just means cutting off their tails to stop tail biting. Um, so again, that's, you know, in some places supposed to be something that's only used if um, nothing else can be done to stop the tail biting. But um, but some in some places it's also just routine. And it's done, if it's done when they're young enough, it can be done without anesthetic as well. So if you imagine cutting the tail off of any animal, like a dog or something, um, when they're a puppy, no anesthetic, that would um, be pretty upsetting to most people to imagine that. Um, but that's sort of the reality for pigs a lot of the time. Right. Are there any behavioral or psychological disorders that are common among farmed pigs? Just in terms of their um, behavior when they are kept in these systems. So, you know, they display a lot of um, sort of stress, like stress induced behavior, essentially, like they're they're frustrated, they're bored. Um, It's it's an unpleasant environment for them. So um, uh, cannibalism is also a problem. They'll just start doing on each other like if they'll have um they'll have like these painful prolapses like rectal prolapses um so their behinds will be all kind of bloody and sore and uh one of them will just you know one of them will have that and then other pigs will start sort of like chewing on it um so it's a pretty horrible uh uh sort of set of behaviors that they sometimes display because they're in these really unnatural conditions which are really um not n- not conducive to their well-being at all um, so I think those kinds of behaviors really are indicative of the level of stress that they're experiencing. Yeah, I read somewhere that a pig's intelligence is equivalent to a seven-year-old child. Oh, so, is, that, that the, is that the equivalent in human terms? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they I forgot mean, if it was seven or, or what the exact age was, but yeah. Yeah, you can see them, you know, all these things like, oh, a pig can play a video game or a pig can like sort all these colors, like, you know, all, all these shapes together and this sort of uh, all this amazing stuff that they can do. Um, and again, they're like, like chickens are, um, you know, they're very social. Um, they'll sort of have their own relationships with each other and all of that gets, um, sort of disrupted or, um, or even not allowed to really form properly, uh, when they're kept in these conditions. So you, uh, one of the weird things about like talking about animal intelligence is also, thinking about how uh when we're looking at the way like a farmed animal behaves and we think oh yeah pigs are actually really smart it's like maybe we only see it in certain conditions like in certain captive conditions versus how they would be in the wild if they had the freedom to really exercise their full uh capacities they could you know they could do even more astonishing things like there was that um uh a case of the wild boar that sprung another boar from a trap. Um, I can't remember where it was in Germany or somewhere a couple of years ago. And so they, and it, these boars displayed this incredible problem solving skill uh, by figuring out how to open this trap essentially. And yeah, so, and that's, you know, partly because if they're out in the wild and they're able to, um, you know, sort of interact freely with their environment, it can really, um, they have an opportunity to display even greater levels of intelligence. So um, it's it's also, I think, you think of animals being kept in quite intensive systems, and in a sense, it's a it's a deprivation of um, you know sensory input that would help like help them develop and help them like experience things properly. And you know, sort of if you think of the equivalent with humans, if you're thinking of children who don't get to um see nature or don't get to read books or don't get to do any of this stuff like of course it will affect like how well they can engage with the world um and with animals it's just the same kind of thing it's like this you know um they get kind of stunted in their ability to become who they would be uh which is another loss i think in, in all that for me is that that's one of the the other really sad things about these systems 
Yeah, for sure. Ever since I heard that study, I always think of these farmed pigs as these seven-year-old human kids who are just cramped and locked inside this facility their whole lives, and、yeah. they're not given freedom to play or do anything. You can only imagine how much psychological stress or trauma they're going through, right? Like you mentioned,、yeah. they even cannibalize each other, which is definitely not natural. Yeah. But okay, so they're placed in these facilities to grow up to get fattened up. And then, what's the next stage?、Um, yeah, so they're they're in there until they're about like a hundred kilos or so.、Um, so maybe that's around like two years old, maybe a bit a bit under that,、um, sort of one and a half to two years old. And then they'll be sent to slaughter. So yeah, they'll be transported somewhere、um, for pigs. Like I mentioned earlier, they're supposed to be、um, gassed、uh, to, or at least it's quite common to gas them. In order to stun them, so that、um, they should be unconscious when their throats are cut.、Um, again, it's not that gentle of a method of doing it. Not always necessarily successful.、Um, Is and, this similar to how chickens are gassed? Yeah. So using using CO two, I think it'd be probably different concentrations depending on the animals involved.、Um, but that's that's sort of the one of the really common ways to stun them. Is to gas them first and and、uh, to render them unconscious. So,、um, yeah. But if you,、uh, you know, just all, all the things we were saying about how smart pigs are and they're very social and all that sort of thing,、um, slaughterhouses can, for that reason, be really stressful for them as well because they can really,、uh, you know, they they pick up on each other's like feelings. So when you've got all of these pigs that are really stressed out and kind of can smell blood and this and that, and you know they're in a new place and they're being like maybe handled quite roughly,、um, it's quite a frightening experience for them, and it's pretty horrible for their last moments.、Um, they're just sort of you know、uh, funneled into this place where they're they're then gassed, maybe not totally successfully, and then have their throats cut. So、um, pretty horrible way for them to go. Yeah, it must be awful. Anything else you want to mention on the slaughter or the transport process? I would just say about transport. So one thing this and this covers other animals. So in,、um, I don't think there's any really legal protections in the in Canada for for farmed animals. Um, in in the U.S.,、um, the Animal Welfare Act doesn't cover、um, animals meant for food,、um, except in transport. There was an amendment made、um, at some point, and so now they're they're covered. In some ways,、um, when they're being transported, but、um, when it comes to everything else, it's just there's there's nothing really to protect them.、Um, so there's no there's no real legal concern <laughs> for their welfare at all、um, in the U.S. or in Canada. Yeah, I think definitely EU is leading the way in terms of animal welfare regulations. It's still not great, but hopefully. Other major countries like U.S. and Canada can also follow in their footsteps. Shall we move on to cows now? Yeah. Okay. So there's two use cases for cows, right? There's dairy and then there's beef. Let's start with the dairy cows first. Who gets selected to be dairy cows, and what's the process like? Yeah. So so dairy cows and、um, and beef cows tend to be like they're sort of different. They're bred differently because again, you want. Is it a dairy cow? You want, you know, <laughs> a farmer wants a dairy cow to produce a lot of milk.、Um, a beef farmer wants a beef cow to,、um, you know, have a lot of good quality meat.、Um, so they're sort of quite they're different in that sense.、Um, and so for this reason, like on a dairy farm,、um, so one one thing that somehow a lot of people oddly don't Realize is that obviously to produce milk, a cow needs to get pregnant because she's a mammal.、Um, so she has to be impregnated.、Um, she has to give birth, and then her calf will get taken away from her most of the time within a couple of days.、Um, this has been like there's again like quite a lot of video evidence of cows like feeling quite distressed by this, like you know really running after their calves when they get taken from them. Um, you know, there's reports of them sort of like crying, like and the and the calves crying、um, when they're separated,、um, when they're so young. So、um, there's you know debate in within the dairy industry and、um, amongst people who want you know high welfare for them about when is the right time to separate them.、Um, but I mean, really, it's you know I guess there's potential for it always to be 
quite cruel to <laughs> it might depend on the cows as well like they are individuals so um but one of the other problems with this system is that um the dairy industry doesn't really have a use for male calves so um at least it became sort of more normal um at one point to just shoot them on farm uh so in the UK this this isn't really allowed anymore so um the calves will often get sent off to a calf dealer where they'll either just go straight to a slaughterhouse um or they might get sold on to be turned into beef um but uh the the shooting of male calves um at a, at a day old or so is a you know when people sort of hear about that they do tend to find that very upsetting if they didn't realize that happened yeah for sure so all the female cows will eventually become dairy cows yes yeah so they end up um same same sort of fate as their mothers which is essentially to be um you know impregnated by artificial insemination uh multiple times have a calf have the calf taken away and have her milk taken away to be sold to humans all right so <laughs> again this is quite depressing but <laughs> it's basically it's a mother who keeps getting impregnated and then her babies keep getting taken away from her yes and then this process repeats until she can't produce milk anymore yeah pretty much so, yes. so it's quite a good subject <laughs> all right so what are the living conditions like for these dairy cows right so dairy um the dairy industry is quite intensive um as well so you know you've probably seen images um or videos of like those crazy milking machines there'll be like loads of cows around it and they'll have um sort of things attached to their udders so it's done in a quite industrial way it's not really that sort of you know one person sitting on a little stool milking the cow um uh so much anymore that that wouldn't um put enough milk on the shelves so um and again dairy cows have been um really bred selectively to produce a lot more a lot more milk than they used to um so one of the uh problems that this has given rise to is um something called mastitis which is like an inflammation of the udder it's quite a common problem on dairy farms um there's also a lot of lameness because they're standing quite often for quite long periods um during like milking time on like concrete ground um so it's not not great for them physically to go through this um it's quite uh you know quite grueling for them um there's you know i guess places where they're treated better or worse there's um there was a, a episode of bbc's panorama a while back which showed undercover footage of um a dairy farm which you know really shocked <laughs> britain quite a lot because it was uh you know the cows were being treated awfully they're being kicked they're being prodded they're being hit they were being uh left you know struggling and in pain on the ground without veterinary care all sorts of things were going on so um you know in some places that that kind of thing does happen to them as well in addition to um to all of the sort of standard things that they have to go through to produce the milk with such an unnaturally big udder is it just uncomfortable to even exist? <laughs> like, um, it's such a huge butter and you're constantly forced to produce milk. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I can only I can only sort of like, you know, imagine to some extent like what it feels like, you know, if you're feeling really bloated and you're feeling really full, <laughs> like there's that, you know, uncomfortable feeling. It kind of looks like that. Um, but I mean, I think one of the big problems like I said is really also about that like inflammation of the udders. Um uh which is which is so common just because they're you know they're producing so much more milk than they than they used to um and are are having calves like every um you know sort of as often as they can really so i think i think it's a calf a year is pretty standard um but yes yeah, it's, it's quite a lot for them physically okay aside from the milking machine where are these dairy cows usually kept and what are the living conditions like yeah so they they're sort of um they're kept indoors um a lot of the time they often won't go on grass at all their entire lives um so they'll also just be fed um you know sort of a, a mixture of of grains and um and that sort of thing and they uh yeah so they won't really get much freedom at all um to to sort of do anything um and again like with other animals you you know they 
they have a playful side and they, you know, uh, have social bonds and um, they're curious and they're quite smart and all those sorts of things. They just don't really get to express any of that um, when they're kept in these sorts of conditions. So, um, but it is, yeah, the dairy industry has really gotten very intensive um, because it's the most economical way to, to produce milk. Um, there's a few, uh, you know, um, maybe a handful of uh, places that are trying to do things a lot better. And there's going to be some that are more like organic, you know, uh, pasture raised dairy or whatever. But um, yeah, so, so some of them are, are better than others, but um, for the most part, the milk on the shelf is, you know, at the supermarket is um, from an intensive system. So for eggs and meat, there are a few common certifications that I've noticed. So for example, like free range, grain fed, etc. But for dairy products, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't notice any that are common, at least in my area. Are there any noteworthy certifications for dairy products? Yeah, I mean, I guess that like, you might have like organic, um, or that kind of thing. So by that, you know, that means different things in different places. But I mean, one one thing would be something like, I guess, depending on if if they if they keep the calves with the mothers for longer, they would probably advertise that quite a lot because that would be you know potentially quite popular with certain consumers. Um, because people, you know, at least they say that they care and that they would be willing to pay more money for um, higher welfare sort of milk and that kind of thing. Um, so if if people are particularly concerned, they could always try and keep an eye out for um, for anything that you know any brands that mention that or look into the certification schemes, if there are any that are, you know, a milk bottles labeled with, um, it would, it should tell them what kind of conditions the um, cows are living in. Got it. And then what happens to the cow after she stops being able to produce milk? They do get slaughtered at the end of their productive life. Um, so that will be maybe after three or four calves because they don't produce as much milk after that. Um, and they often have like, sort of lameness and um sort of become infertile after a certain point so yeah they get sent to slaughter as well got it got it all right lots of content to cover for this episode so let's move on to the final one which is beef cows so what's it like for them how does the whole process work yeah so they um beef cattle are really you know they they're, they're bred for their the quality of their meat um so they're uh different from the dairy cows, although now there's also a bit more um, of a push within the industry to kind of like have cross like crossovers between dairy and beef um, to try and sort of uh, make use of, of, you know, male dairy calves and that kind of thing. So, um, and try and kind of maximize profit. Um, so yeah. And their, um, their lives are, better overall um i would say than a than a dairy cows because most beef cows um do graze on pasture for at least some of their life not all of them there's quite a lot also kept in like those you know those big feed lots um where they'll they'll just sort of like really live there but um quite a lot do get to live out on pasture um doesn't mean that they are there the whole time they'll they'll often be um sent to a feed lot uh just for the last few months of their lives so they can get fattened up a bit faster um before they're sent off to slaughter um but they're not sort of you know (laughs) they're not getting continually impregnated and separated from their children and all that sort of stuff so it's like slightly better to be a, a, a beef cow right okay so they're spending a few months in these feedlots to get fattened up and then what happens after that um so yeah when they're sent to slaughter so again, they'll be transported. Um, they uh, will be, they won't be gassed the same as like pigs. Um, they tend to use captive bolt guns to their heads to sort of stun them before they're, uh, before they're sort of shackled up and their throats are cut. Oh, wow. Um, what exactly is a bolt gun? It's, it's kind of what it sounds like. Like it's sort of a bolt that they shoot into their skulls. And <laughs> it's, um, yeah, supposed to at least render them totally unconscious and or or kill them um but they don't always work necessarily um there's you know sort of reports of of them not being uh, administered correctly 
and that kind of thing. So it's not, again, not a foolproof way to make sure that these cows like go out as painlessly as possible. Wouldn't a cow freak out if it had a gun pointed to its head? How do they even restrain it enough to do this? And I, I would imagine like once they take it to the slaughterhouse, it can smell the blood. It can sense that something is wrong. So, yeah. They, they're kind of like, they're restrained. So um, they, they're kind of put in from the truck into a sort of like chute and then kind of like herded through that um, in, you know, in places, some places, some sort of houses, they might use electric prods to kind of get them through. They're not supposed to use them here, but um, there is evidence of that happening. They'll, they can be hit or shouted at to get them to move along. And then, yeah, they're sort of like in a, um, in a restrained space uh, at the point of stunning. So it's, yeah, very, Again, very like high stress situation for them. As you mentioned, they're kind of like aware, sort of aware of what's going on. Um, or at least they seem to be particularly aware of what's going on. Um, and looking quite like freaked out by everything, uh, which seems understandable. So yeah, it's not, um, not a calm environment for them. All right. So that's it for beef cows. I just want to zoom out a bit and take a, a macro view on things now. Can you give us an overview of? The, the state of animal welfare laws across the world. Like, I, I know EU is probably the leader. It's still not great, but it's something. And then we have the US, which is behind, and then Canada, which is even worse. So, yeah, w- what's the state of animal welfare regulations across the world? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I mean, so the UK where I am is a bit better than quite a lot of places um, in terms of its welfare legislation for farmed animals. Um, you know, we have regulations around a lot more aspects of um, how animals are raised, transported and slaughtered than um, you have in other places. Uh, the, the EU does have um, some protections as well, but also um, fewer <laughs> in other situations. So um, and it can vary a bit by country. Um, in yeah, in North America, not great. Um, Canada, I'm pretty sure the industry just sets its own standards which, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's hard to imagine them going too far on, um, welfare by themselves because it costs more money essentially to, you know, to have better welfare for animals on farms a lot of the time. Um, and yeah, other countries are, you know, I mean, obviously there are places in Asia which are really not great. Um, China's got, um, some crazy things going on there, like with that massive, you know, multi-story pig farm, um, which isn't necessarily worse welfare-wise than anywhere else. It's just, it's just another crazy aspect of it. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not great for animals. Like overall, um, I'd say far too few countries have any sort of decent welfare legislation in place. Um, even though I think a, quite a lot of people would like to see more of it. Um, certainly in the US, there's a, there's a weird disparity between uh, what people want and then how they behave, which is that like something like 47% of people want in the US want slaughterhouses banned, which doesn't make sense because they also love their meat. So, you know, there's a bit of a disconnection between what people uh, sort of understand about what a slaughterhouse is and, and how their meat comes to be. So it's, uh, yeah, um, it, I think it's better the more clarity people can have about how, food is getting to their plate, um, you know, the better they can make decisions about whether they want to participate in that or not. Yeah, I think, like you said, a lot of people are against this, but they kind of turn a blind eye or they're not fully aware of what happens behind the scenes. So for someone who's listening to this and they feel against this industry and they want to change it, what should they do to influence the most change to improve the welfare conditions of these animals? Yeah, so, um, I mean, one thing that is really powerful is undercover investigations. I mean, there's quite a lot of them. So sometimes I think people do get a little bit of fatigue about, you know, uh, oh, another farm, another, another sort of load of animals being treated badly. But, um, and this isn't to say people should go out and start undercover investigating farms, but that, um, you know, very easily you can help these things like spread around the internet and, and get more, um, uh, media coverage and that can be a really great way um, for this stuff to get in front of, uh, you know, politicians, um, especially if there's any, like, who you know are kind of sympathetic to animal welfare. 
Um, you know, in the US, we've got a, a few more that are starting to be that way. Like there's, you know, Eric Adams in New York, who's a vegan and has um, brought in more um, plant-based food and um, as a sort of like normal thing and public institutions there. And um, so I think that there's, you know, there's always politicians potentially you could like identify as being like, okay, they're sympathetic to animal welfare and you could, you could write to them, you can try and get like certain things in front of them. Um, so that's one thing. Um, definitely like, I mean, protesting, I think, you know, it, 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 it can be frustrating sometimes feeling like you're not getting anywhere. But I also think just showing, showing up for the animals in those contexts, um, even if you can't always get the change immediately, um, there needs to be more visibility for like people, you know, that people do care about uh how they're being treated they do care about the conditions on farms um they're not willing to turn a blind eye to it and just um making that more visible is really important um and then and again that can you know that can help get media coverage for some things um so and that's always like you know quite important for putting putting pressure on people who have the power to change things um so those are some of the things that you can do i mean getting getting involved with any um you know good um animal protection charity that's like really campaigning for for change um and for for better welfare legislation uh there's always sort of ways that you can volunteer with them or um you know get involved as an activist yeah this undercover idea is quite interesting because these videos have the ability to go viral and reach a huge audience Mm -hmm. how can we directly support these undercover efforts like are there any particular people or organizations that you'd like to mention yeah i mean well so also because i write for them i write um for their their blog every week um but animal justice projects in the uk is really great um for doing like incredible undercover investigations so finding places like that where you can see um the work that they've done um, and also like the media coverage they've had, you know, you can always donate to those places. Like the stuff costs money. They usually run on donations. Um, maybe they get a small grant from somewhere. Um, but, but certainly having money coming in from donors, um, like individual donors is really important to support that kind of work. Um, you know, you can always, um, just like to also like go to protests at places where they've, you know, done an investigation. There's often, um, if an investigation has come out into a certain farm or slaughterhouse showing, oh, this place has really horrible conditions. Um, activists also often follow that up with like trying to get as many people to go and actually protest that place as possible. And in some cases that's led to, uh, you know, some, some operations getting shut down because they've had too much like media attention and they've, you know, then been found to be not complying with certain, um, you know, regulations or whatever. So, um, so just like showing up for stuff like that can be really a really good way to support those kinds of organizations. On the note of protests, I have a a few thoughts that I want to get your feedback on. Mm -hmm. One is that for protesting, if it's too subtle, if the scale is too small, then it's just not going to stir up enough exposure or awareness and people, especially the decision makers, aren't going to care. On the flip side, if it's too extreme and too disruptive, like blocking highways, for example, that might actually piss people off and turn them against the cause that you're fighting for. So I was just wondering, like, how do we find a good balance and and what types of protests would actually work the best? (laughs) Oh my God, that's a big question. Yeah, it's a pretty loaded question. Yeah, there's like a whole, there's loads of theory and research done into like what makes the protest effective. And um, actually, I would just say to your your listeners, if you want to include this, um, if they're interested in what kinds of protests are really effective or what kinds of animal advocacy are most effective, um, I encourage you to go and look at, um, like the research of faunalytics, which is like a really data driven animal advocacy sort of like research, um, group essentially. And I think they did some really cool research into this kind of thing. Like, you know, are disruptive protests, um, most effective or are, um, you know, or is sharing graphic video is most effective or is this most effective and so if if you want to know then that's a really great place to look yeah thanks for sharing that so faunalytics uh, i'll definitely share that in the show notes i'm also curious to hear your story and how you got started i know right now you're a freelance writer for animal justice and animal agriculture 
So how did you get started and why are you doing this? Yeah, so I, um, I'm a freelance writer. Um, and I, yeah, I focus a lot on animals and animal agriculture and, um, the environment. And, um, so I write, uh, like I mentioned weekly at the moment for animal justice projects. And I used to do something similar for surge activism, which is another, um, sort of animal advocacy and activist group. Um, and then on top of that, do like sort of writing for, um, different outlets on, um, animal related issues so when when i started um writing um and pitching a few years ago i just sort of like naturally started gravitating towards like animal issues um because i became vegan a few years ago and that sort of you know then i was reading more and more about that and like learning more about um the the uh, animal agriculture industry and just um yes yeah, so that's that sort of happens up yeah, so I'm curious on that point. What exactly was the trigger or the catalyst that caused you to turn vegan and proactively seek out the truth in the meat industry? Because I think a lot of people, they, they kind of know how it works, but they just turn a blind eye. But yeah, what made you want to dig deeper? Yeah, so I was writing an article on a documentary called Hogwarts which was by um the charity Viva, the vegan charity Viva. And um that looked at um their m- multiple investigations into a really horrific pig farm in the UK called Hogwood. Um and their sort of efforts to get it dropped by its suppliers, um, like Tesco and um, you know, other big supermarkets. And um uh, just watching that, like it was, I mean, I was already vegetarian, but even though the documentary wasn't really to do with, um, the dairy industry, which is, you know, the lot, like the last holdout for like vegetarians, like, oh, I can't give up my cheese. Um, it, it sort of just, I just couldn't participate anymore, like in, in what was happening to animals, um, in that respect at all. So, uh, just sort of went vegan then and there. And that was, yeah, that was 20, um and so from there i just sort of like got sort of more and more um into the sort of like vegan community on twitter and then you know story ideas come to you that way and then people start sending you investigations and like oh can you write about this and so you know you end up um you, you know kind of like working on the topic that way sometimes so uh that's how that happens I just, I want to add a bit earlier actually on like what people can do and just thinking about protests and stuff. Like I think one of the, one of the good places to target is actually, uh, supermarkets and, and retailers. Like, you know, they're, they're selling these products. If you, if you find out that there's, uh, there's been an investigation into a farm that's supplying, um, a big supermarket. Uh, you can, you know, often there'll be protests at that place that, um, you know, whoever did the investigation will organize. That's a really great place to go and protest and see some change because, um, those supermarkets don't like the bad press. And sometimes they do drop the farm as a supplier, which is, you know, if you can't get the legislation changed, that quickly like that's a that's a fast way for there to be backlash against these farms that are like really egregiously um sort of breaching whatever minimal animal welfare standards there are in place so um so that's a really um, effective thing i think actually that people can do yeah that's actually a very good idea because supermarkets are the main link between consumers and the meat industry so that would be a super effective place to target yeah all right final question from your years of writing and research in this space, if you could narrow it down to some main call to actions or lessons that you'd like to share with our audience, what would that be? You know, learn what you can. Like, don't don't like turn a blind eye to this stuff. Like, you know, it's not it's not one bad apple, uh, as as the industry likes to say about you know any time there's evidence of like animals being poorly treated on a farm like there's a lot of these farms that do this it's not like these conditions are not good for animals or for the people that work on them they they you know they're places of exploitation slaughterhouses are places of violence um you know if if that worries you at all 
it's not hard to find um, all the information you need to kind of make an informed decision about whether you want to keep participating in those industries. Um, I'd say, um, you know, don't be afraid to talk about this with people. Um, there's the, you know, if, if, if you think, oh, I want to at least change sort of what kinds of products I'm buying, not necessarily go vegan. I mean, I'd always advocate go vegan, but, um, you know, if you don't want to do that, then, you know, at least like being, um, talking to people about it and, and just not being afraid to like have those conversations. Um, if you want to see change around you as well, that's really important. Um, I found that like a lot of my friends have started eating way more vegan food just because hanging around me and talking to me a lot and like you know uh it, it's been actually like a really lovely way for us all to bond together we all you know uh the kinds of things that they they'll cook when i come over it's just like a real it's like source of joy for us actually to share in this food together and to um you know try cooking different things for each other so that's that's been really nice like so having conversations is really important it can open up space for change uh in ways that you don't always expect Nice. Well, thank you so much, Claire, for coming on. This was super insightful, and I'm sure our listeners have learned a lot from this episode. So thank you once again. That's it for today's episode of EcoChat. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and comment on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. It really helps get our show in front of more people. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for next episode.